Good afternoon and welcome to today's Euromed Migration Talk. Today we are very happy to have with us a leading expert in population and migration studies from Cairo, Egypt. Ayman Zoghri, thank you for being with us today. Professor, I mean, you have uh, quite some experience in the field and we're really looking forward to hearing uh, your thoughts about the migration narrative in the Mediterranean. So if we can just dive in, let's think about 2015 when the migra so-called migration crisis uh, hit uh, the region. And uh, since then we see how the migration narrative in the Mediterranean has been strongly polarized. Now, do you think that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has actually reinforced this polarization? And if so, how has it done so? Well, the uh, migration narratives in the Mediterranean is always polarized. So it's not uh, actually uh, related to the uh, what's called migration uh, crisis in uh, 2015. Uh, remember that migration crisis actually it is, was not a, a migration crisis. It is, uh, migration is not a crisis. It, well, actually, it is political crisis in Syria, not uh, a migration crisis. And also, it's, it's not migration crisis for everyone. It is been regarded from the European side, uh, side as a migration crisis. But uh, actually from the side of Syria, for instance, from the side of refugees themselves, from the side of migrants themselves, it's a heaven, not crisis, just to escape the, the, the threats in, uh, in Syria. So it is the, the uh, uh, going back to the, the uh, COVID-19, uh, well, actually from my point of view, uh, this is not to undermine the impact of uh, COVID-19 on all aspects of, of our lives, but I don't see an, a, a strong impact of COVID-19 on the migration narrative simply because it is still the same setting, same, condi uh, same conditions here and there, uh, here and there means in, I mean in the two shores of the Mediterranean. So nothing new about it. What happened uh, just it's not related to the narratives, it's, it's related to the human mobility, just the, the whole movement. So COVID-19, what, what did it um, made to migration? Actually, it made like when you pause a uh, video, when you halt something. So it just paused it for a while and now it is getting back to normal or abnormal from the, the other side of the Mediterranean. <laughs> Uh, you, you do raise some very good points and so you said that the narrative hasn't changed that much however you know we can see that during the, the pandemic the role of uh, key migrant workers in very fundamental sectors of the economy of the whole region has been very relevant and highly reported about now do you think that reporting on these efforts so the uh, basically the role played by uh, migrant key workers has actually contributed to nurturing a less polarized debate on migration or the effects are not there yet? Oh, uh, well, actually, there's always a lag between action and effect. Yeah, we, uh, we, uh, everyone realizes this, but they, they think that it's good. It's good ju just to show that the uh, health workers, in, uh, in, uh, especially in France and Italy, uh, come from different uh, nationalities, especially the, the uh, North Africa, but from uh, other side, this is a brain drain. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this mean that uh, you know Europe good benefit of the uh, people who were uh, you know uh, uh, living in in the other region or in the other shore of the Mediterranean. Uh, this means also that migration is good, and we do not need for us a, as a, a southern people we do not need to prove that migration is good because we know that migration is good. So the propaganda about this actually may change the narrative for in the other side in in at your side, not at our side, because we know that migration is good. So, uh, and also the, the same thing, you know, we don't, we just forget uh, issues. The same thing happened when, when France won the World Cup. And uh, yeah, you remember the picture of the, the uh, of French course. team and, uh, you know, relating them to their origin. That it is just been taken as something very nice to just exchange in Facebook or, or in Twitter. But this doesn't change the uh, reality that migration is good to the two of us, despite the uh, different narratives and the different points of view. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, you, you do talk about a specific image, an image of when France won, won the World Cup. Unfortunately, as an Italian, I only have bad memories about recent football endeavors. But uh, uh, talking about uh, the example you made earlier about, uh, you know, putting a stop on a video and then the video at a certain point when you when you when you hit play again things will go back to normal so i mean if we look at this pandemic that uh, you know it put the world on a hold and uh, uh, europe especially now the consequences seem to be a lot harsher uh, in the american continent however uh, so you said that for you it's just to put uh, to hit the stop button for a moment. But yeah. do you think there will actually be some long-term uh, consequences that we still cannot see today, or do you think that everything will just go back to normal and even people in your field, uh, researchers in population and migration studies, will have to reconsider how migration is perceived today? What do you think? Do you think there will be short-term? Uh, changes, long-term changes. What are your uh, predictions on that? Okay. Well, so the the example I, I gave, or the just the uh, for simplification. So the whole thing, the the movie, and then everything goes back the uh, as normal. It, it, it's just for simplification, but uh, actually nothing will be uh, normal after uh, COVID-19 or after what, what's happening now in the, in, the, in the political arena and also in the health arena, uh, simply because there are consequences of this halt. There are consequences of this halt in the uh, near future and also in the uh, way the two shores of the, of the Mediterranean look at migration, uh, simply because, uh, first of all, the importance of uh, selectivity of migration. Now Europe will be more selective in uh, the, the issues of migration. Well, uh, for instance, we'll allow more physician doctors to come simply because they felt the need of more physician doctors because of the, the, the pandemic. Other thing that they, they uh, you know, staying at home for more, one, more than 100 days, like myself and many people in the world, showed the importance of technology and uh, to the extent that we're doing this by uh, using technology, instead of uh, you send someone from your office in Cairo to interview me physically or something like that. So this will change the, the, the realities of migration as well, simply because this will increase the outsourcing. It means you, I don't need Ayman Zohri to come to Rome in, a, in an office to manage a, a project on migration in the Mediterranean. I can hire him while he's at home in Cairo. So uh, uh, this is, very clear now at the time of COVID-19 that you do not need to move people, you can move jobs. So this will affect the, the migration uh, narratives in the, uh, not only in the Mediterranean uh, uh, region, but in, in the whole world. Let's try to take a step back and I would like you to help us a little more with a, with a more academic concept. Now, in light of your studies, yeah. can you help us better understand the relationship between migration as, a, as an overall phenomenon, population and public health. I mean, how are these three elements intertwined when we look at migration in the Mediterranean? Ah, yes. Uh, so the relation between migration and, and population is very clear, simply because uh, usually or theoretically speaking, people move from the, uh, the, the, the countries or the regions with uh, uh, demographic surplus, like in the, the African continent, to regions with demographic shortage or demographic deficit. Uh, but this is theoretically speaking, but it is not as simple as that. The, this doesn't mean that, you know, the surplus of population of uh, Africa will move to fulfill or to fill in the gap in Europe with the demographic deficit simply because there are constraints between this. There is the selectivity of migration and there are also the, the, the uh, solutions that uh, Europe can, can do for their demographic deficit. So it is not us to just to tell Europeans that take the, the surplus because you have deficit because in, in many cases they don't match simply because the Europe need a specific quality, specific technical uh, and specific skills that may not be available in the countries of the surplus. This is one. Two, they, with respect to public health, I'm not talking about public health as people fit to work, but about the, the uh, epidemics, pandemics, and the transfer of 
diseases. So the, the, the one medium, one important medium of transfer of not only diseases, but also uh, habits, uh, health habits and culture of uh, health culture is migration. Simply because migrant, when he or she comes from a specific country to another country, he or she doesn't come just only as a human or a labor force. Uh, they come or he or she uh, comes with culture, makeup, and also uh, uh, epidemic makeup or uh, pandemic makeup or cultural uh, health culture makeup. So the, and th this means that even migration doesn't only distribute uh, humans uh, over the, the globe, but also distribute the incidences of uh, the prevalence of diseases and prevalence of uh, cultural uh, habits related to disease and health. I see. Uh, so there seems to be also a, a, an important issue with dialogue and uh, try to uh, make the parties understand all the parties involved from mm -hmm. the countries that are uh, let's say in surplus and then uh, are then uh, whose, whose population is moving towards countries that are in deficit. Mm -hmm. So dialogue seem always to be kind of a, of a debatable issue because uh, yes. Uh, on one side you have the facts and then on the other side you have the emotions of the people yeah. that need to uh, to work and to, uh, to, to to basically apply integration initiatives and policies. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when we talk about dialogue, a lot of focus in discussing the migration narratives is on the media. Yeah. However, I would like to, to check with you what can be the role of academia in promoting a better dialogue to rebalance the migration narrative. So what is your suggestion to promote uh, dialogue within this scope, within the academic world, to rebalance the migration narrative? I mean, is it possible that academics uh, engage in a way that affect the way migration is perceived in the region? Yes, of course. Uh, first of all, uh, there is a good relation between academics and the two shorts. Uh, of the Mediterranean. That's I have. I myself have good, very good relations with uh, uh, peer colleagues in uh, uh, migration research in Europe and in France, Italy, uh, Greece, and all uh, countries of uh, Europe. So the relation is really good at the academic level. The role of academics, actually, we produce knowledge. So even you know when when the media people, when the politicians talk about migration, they are their talks are based on what we produce because we produce the basic knowledge that can decisions of politicians or even the, the media campaigns can be based on. So this is the, the very important role of academics. Uh, I see. Now, talking about dialogues, uh, yeah. uh, as an Egyptian professor, I would like to, to mention to you um, something that has been studied in a, in a British university, which is the so-called Salah effect. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm discussing uh, the, um, uh, about a prominent uh, uh, footballer, Mohamed Salah. <laughs> yeah. He's probably the, <laughs> one, of, he was, he was one of the strongest footballers in the world today, probably one of the strongest Egyptian footballer ever. Yeah. Uh, there are some studies that indicate the following. So in certain areas of um, the city of Liverpool and outside Liverpool, where uh, the strong, a stronghold of Liverpool supporters live, yeah. uh, the attitudes of uh, people living in these communities towards Islam has dramatically improved together with Salah's outstanding performance. Now, yeah. And this is the so-called Salah effect. You can check yes. it in Stanford yes. magazine. So there is actually... Yeah. I read about it. <laughs> it's actually, actually it's Alexandra Ziegel, a postdoctoral mm -hmm. scholar at Stanford's Immigration Policy Lab. So they actually, yeah. so there is tangible research that shows how, let's call them these champions of migration are actually making an impact in uh, integration yeah. policy and in rebalancing the migration narrative. I think there is even uh, 
uh, a chant by Liverpool supporters that says something along the line, and if Salah scores one more goal, I will be a Muslim as well. <laughs> of course, there is a bit of, um, you know, a bit of, of, of play, uh, of wordplay, and yeah. usually th- that, uh, uh, that community is always quite, uh, uh, they, they like humor. Now, do you think that champions of migrations or, uh, uh, you know, highlighting these exceptional individuals can actually help rebalance the narrative in receiving countries and across the region? What are your thoughts on this? Of course. Uh, first, I'm proud that Salah is uh, from my country. Um, and, and actually, the Salah effect is very important in balancing the narrative and also in accepting the other in, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, but how many Salah we need? <laughs> uh, this is the issue. So it's an, uh, Salah is an exception. Salah is a, uh, just an icon that can be used by media. But we need many Salahs. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good point. And uh, you know, <laughs> talent is a, is a scarce good. Of course. Uh, professor, <laughs> j- just to conclude, um, this is something that I have asked uh, all, uh, all other previous uh, people we interviewed. Yeah. Uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a huge dilemma, not only in, on migration, but uh, uh, for us, especially communication practitioners. Yeah. The so-called facts versus emotion debate or yeah. facts versus emotion dichotomy. Yeah. Now, uh, some people say that the narrative, let's say the migration narrative, influences policymaking. And some other actually say that policy making influences the narrative. Now, to conclude, what are your thoughts on, uh, on that? So where is the chicken and where is the egg? Uh, actually, uh, it's very difficult to say where is the, the uh, chicken and where is the egg, but I think there's uh, uh, another uh, element is missing from this uh, equation, which is the economy. The debate on migration is settled by the need for the economy. That's, it's not settled by politicians, by the way. I, say, I always say this. So the debate actually is not between the, the acceptance of people and, and the left and right and versus the, the politics. It is b- between politics and the economy. So what determines actually who comes and who stay uh, behind the borders is the economy, not, my, not the, the uh, yeah. policy. The determinant of migration actually is the economy, not anything else. Or you can say that 90% of the the decisions about migration are made by the need of the economy rather than the will of the the, uh, politicians or their desires or their speeches just to attract uh, people to to re-elect them. Thank you, thank you very much. And to our followers, Uh, We'll be back again uh, next week with another interview, always uh, on a Tuesday afternoon. Professor Ayman Zori, thank you again. Have a great day. Thank you very much. And we'll be in touch very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.